right, yes, I have slides. That doesn't move, that's really heavy. Okay, so, I, oh yes, all right, sound too. Uh, hey, I'm Abby Jones. Uh, before I um, start talking, I want to ask if any of you have ever uh, used the, the reason of consistency to explain why a certain interface should be implemented. So have you ever been like, oh yeah, we should do this to be consistent with other things? Okay. All right, you're all horrible people. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I've been told the spotlight is over here, but I, it's nice here because I can actually see all of you. Um, so uh, the, I'm up here today to talk about reasons why consistency is helpful, but also when not to be consistent with your own interface, other interfaces, or the real world. And uh, before I do that, I have to give you a disclaimer uh, because I work at Google. And uh, so you should know that these are my own opinions. They are not Google's opinions. Um, <laughs> I'm not, Google is not paying me to be up here to say these things. Uh, today, I'm going to give you examples about brains, experimental aircraft, Google Docs, emoji, Microsoft Word, Pokemon, design software, virtual reality, coffee, and games. And uh, I'm going to skip the Q&A afterwards so you can get to lunch. So first of all, put your hands up in the air. Wiggle your fingers around. Like real, come on, I see people just standing there. Really wiggle them. OK, now put your hands in your lap like this. Right. You can close your eyes if you want. Imagine a keyboard. So uh, if you're using a browser, can you open a new tab? with your laptop. Uh, what about making a rectangle? What if you don't want a rectangle? Undo the rectangle. Were you able to accomplish those things? You can nod now, you can look at me, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> you've probably developed pretty good procedural memory uh, in using a keyboard. So um, what is procedural memory? Well. It's what we think of as muscle memory. It's really that you've practiced something so much that you don't even have to think about it anymore. And actually thinking about it makes it hard to do that thing. Uh, so it's not in your muscles, it's actually in your brain. Um, procedural memory is partially stored in your cerebellum. That's the part of your brain that's back here. Uh, but it doesn't just take place in one area of your brain. Uh, we use procedural memory when we ride a bike, tie our shoes, um, type on a keyboard, or when we fly an airplane. And so if we think about somebody like a test pilot, this is Milton Thompson. This is him in 1966 flying some test flights at Air, Edward, Edwards Air Force Base. And um, when he was going to fly test flights, the US space program was using these types of pods to land people from space. If you can't see it, here's the outline. Uh, there are a lot of problems with uh, using a command module as a spacecraft returning to Earth. Um, for one, you're just literally falling through the atmosphere without any control, uh, which is a problem. Um, and then you land using a parachute. And so uh, sometimes the landings would be pretty on target, but other times uh, astronauts would be hundreds of miles off course. And uh, that was an issue. And so uh, NASA, in association with Lockheed Martin, was working on some test aircraft. Um, the other issue with landing with these kind of pod things is that uh, G-forces are hitting you in the wrong direction. So when astronauts were in those pods, they'd be laying backwards, and G-forces are coming from behind their head. Uh, you can actually withstand higher g-force if it's eyeballs in versus eyeballs out. <laughs> I never really thought about the phrase eyeballs out until I was reading about experimental aircraft. Uh, but you know, just so you know, it's the same kind of force you feel if you go on a roller coaster and it feels like your stomach is in your throat. Um, that is your stomach literally trying to go into your throat. So, so <laughs> uh, just so you know what's happening. Uh, so eyeballs in, easier to withstand, G-forces coming at the front of you versus behind. 
Uh, so why not make a new aircraft? This is the M2F2, and it's what they refer to as a heavy lifting body. Uh, it's not uh, some lightweight glider. It's made of a uh, steel core and aluminum, and it's pilotable, which means it can be landed, which means that somebody is coming in and experiencing G-force from the front, and they're going to be able to land in the right place. And it's the predecessor to something like the space shuttle. So the examples I'm showing you today are from 1966. Uh, the space shuttle went into, program went into effect in the early 80s. There's a problem, though. <laughs> These things don't have wings on the side, so they're really unstable. Um, they experience what's called lateral oscillation, so they back and forth, side to side movement. And even before they built the aircraft, the engineers and designers on the aircraft knew that it would have this problem. So they put a special wheel in the aircraft so that a pilot could control the rudders and the flaps. Um, so the rudders are what's on the back of the plane that might move back and forth like this. Uh, the flaps are on the side, they move up and down. It's how you steer a plane and how you get stability. Uh, so they put in one of these wheels and on the morning of July 12th, 1966, Milton Thompson got in the M2F2, um, which is attached to the bottom of the wing of a B-52 airplane. It gives you an idea of how small it is. It's only 10 and a half, 11 feet wide. It's a really small aircraft. So that morning, they're at Edwards Air Force Base. They're going to have him land in a dry lake bed, because uh, that seems safer than landing on a runway. And uh, so what Milton went through is he, um, as a pilot, when he took off, uh, did his checklist, made sure all of his instruments were in the right place, and then uh, counted down only from five when he wanted to be dropped from this B-52. And we actually have video of this event. So, not much better than the other kind of spacecraft at this point, just being dropped through the air. Uh, but the nice thing about it is it has a jet engine in the back of it where you can actually steer it. Uh, the bad thing about it was that um, as Milton was completing a series of maneuvers, which were mostly turns, and he was lining up for um, his last turn, he felt like there would be a controllability problem with the aircraft. So he moved that wheel to the side to point four uh, to try to reduce the oscillations that were happening. And instead of getting a reduction in oscillation, it got worse. And where he was expecting slight lateral oscillation, his aircraft started bucking back and forth. Uh, this wouldn't have been that big of a deal, uh, except that he was at 8,000 feet altitude, and he was descending at 18,000 feet a minute. So with less than 30 seconds to go, uh, what Milton Thompson had to do was ignore all of his procedural memory that he'd built up training for this mission, and instead he reset everything in the cockpit to zero and stopped messing with it. Because if you have PIO, or pilot-induced oscillation in an aircraft, the best thing to do is stop giving the aircraft inputs and instead let it damp out the oscillations on its own. And so with less than 30 seconds to land, he let go. and landed. Uh, he ended up flying a half dozen test flights of this specific aircraft. The final test flight of this aircraft um, ended with a spectacular crash from another pilot who was pulled from it alive. Uh, but what happened? Why did the aircraft end up having longitudinal oscillation when just lateral oscillation was expected? Why didn't the interconnect wheel work to control the amount of oscillation that was happening during the flight? Well, here's the wheel. 
And here is the simulator. So this is the aircraft that Milton Thompson trained on. And what I really like about this is that you can see the plywood on each side. It's built out, out of uh, some old jets. And the problem is that when they built this simulator, they hadn't designed the wheel yet. And so the engineering team used an old brake handle from another aircraft and stuck the brake handle in the same spot. But when you push the brake handle forward, it increased the interconnect ratio. Whereas when you push the wheel forward, it decreased the interconnect ratio. It's kind of like natural scrolling. <laughs> Com complete unexpected interaction there um, through something that's mediated through another interface. And so I have a feeling that very few of you are aircraft designers. Um, but the reason you should care about this is that we design a lot of interfaces that have a significant impact on people's lives, either um, because those people are making decisions about um, the health or safety or well-being of other people, or because we're designing you know, software and tools that help people connect with their loved ones, um, make financial decisions, or keep up with their own health. We hear a lot about making interfaces consistent so they can be intuitive. Uh, but really, intuition just means that something has become part of your procedural memory and you can do it without thinking. So I try not to ever use the term intuitive. Uh, I think it's, a, it's something that doesn't really exist. Um, everything that we do is learned or a response to some sort of stimulation. Instead, I like to think about making software that's predictable especially if it's software where somebody's trying to do a job. So today, let's look at a few different types of consistency and think about how predictability can help people. Um, three ways of dividing things into consistency types are thinking about internal, external, and real-world consistency. And in both internal and external consistency, we can look at interface consistency in the context of color, typography, language, visual elements, layout and location, and interactions. And so layout and location interactions were the primary problems that Milton Thompson had in switching from the brake handle for the interconnect to going to a wheel for the interconnect. There are benefits to having internal consistency in an interface. So it helps users uh, bootstrap their internal learning. It can improve ease of use. And you end up with higher perceived quality in an interface that's consistent. So let's look at a couple other examples of internal consistency. Uh, here we have sharing in Google Docs. And so you can see that on the top, if I want to share this set of emoji, I can just hit that share item in the menu. When the modal for that pops up, it uses the same language, which is about sharing. Um, but if I want to use the mobile app, it doesn't say share, it says add people. Uh, and this is something really confusing, right? It suddenly makes you say, oh, wait a minute, what? Is there a difference? Like, what happens when I add people versus when I share something with other people? Uh, and so that's a, one of the early things in consistency to do is it's not just about naming things, but it's about using the same language each time when somebody's going to perform a similar action. In the same menu on a desktop for Google Docs, I can rename a document or I can share it. And you can see from these two modals, which are launched from the same menu, uh, one is material design and one is Kennedy design. Uh, but you never see them at the same time. And they're similar to enough, enough to each other. They use the same terminology, they use the same interactions, and they use the same colors that it's easy to get away with being inconsistent here. And the reason it's important to start thinking more about consistency is that cognitive control is a depletable resource. So uh, think about how hungry you are right now. And the hungrier you get, the worse you will be at processing what happens in a talk or any other information you hear. And it goes the same with consistency. Dealing with an inconsistent interface 
uh, is ta mentally taxing. And so having one that is consistent can help reduce the cognitive load on your users and in turn help them make better decisions. So let's take a look at versions of external consistency. All right, who here uses an iPhone? Okay, raise your hand. All right, and an Android device, Android phone of any variety. All right, and any other kinds of phones? When I worked at MySpace, I used a Blackberry. Uh, so it's okay if you use some other kind of phone. Okay. So if you use an Android device in 2016, you would see this emoji. Uh, I am not a really experienced emoji user. Technically, I'm a millennial, uh, but I feel really uh, nervous about using emoji. And maybe it's because I feel nervous about using emoji that when I see this one, I think of it as nervous sweating. And, and so at work, and you know, at work it's tiny too. It's not 10 feet tall like it is here, where it's obviously not sweating. But to me, the version that's just 24 pixels tall, it looked like sweating. And so in group chats at work, I was confused about why my colleagues were always using nervous sweating. And I was like, maybe it's just me uh, interpreting it that way because I sweat a lot. And it turned out that was the case uh, because on an iPhone, it looked more like this and it's obviously crying uh, while you're laughing, uh, not sweating. Or it is sweating and you're sweating out your eyes, which would be really painful. So, uh, so I had my own problems with emoji. Uh, it turns out I'm not alone in this. Uh, so if we look at 1F601, uh, which is grinning, the grinning face, um, there's some research out there that shows that there's high variance in how people interpret this grinning face across different platforms. So you can see the Apple one has a negative aspect to it, whereas the Google one is super positive. That means that people who have iPhones and Android devices are trying to communicate with each other, they're sending completely different messages to each other, which is horrifying. <laughs> uh, and even within just the iPhone version of it, there's really wide degree of variance. Like pe some people would think, oh, it's super positive. Then a serious number of people are like, this is a very negative emoji. It's called grin, uh, and yet it's problematic. And so uh, what might happen is you could send your friend a message like, oh, I just went on a date. Oh. <laughs> but if your friend, um, who's probably not at this conference because everyone has an iPhone, if your friend is on an Android device, they see this. But that's not okay. So. <laughs> So external consistency is, um, especially in systems that communicate with each other, is really important. Uh, consistent UIs also help bridge a knowledge gap. Uh, you can think of a knowledge gap as where you are right now, so your current knowledge point, um, and then where you want to be in the future, here's the knowledge gap. So think about something like Microsoft Word, uh, and you can see at the very top of it, got some buttons, a drop-down menu for text, a drop-down menu to choose text size, uh, which is similar to this other interface. So if you're thinking about when to be externally consistent, uh, one way that's helpful to think about it is do I want to bootstrap learning uh, from another interface and make it possible for all those users to also use my new thing. So if we think about the elements of UI consistency, aside from typography, they're all pretty much there between these two UIs. Uh, if Google Docs had used uh, neon colors instead of white and gray, uh, if it had used different um, language for the top menu items like file, edit, view, insert, which are, I have to say, the first five menu items on both of these UIs are exactly the same. Um, 
So our language is the same, the visual elements are the same, drop-down menus for choosing text, a button to print something, uh, ways to align text, and they are laid out and located in the same place. And aside from the real difference in Google Docs, which is the ability to uh, edit a document at the same time and collaborate with other people, uh, the interactions on these two interfaces are the same. So the reason we want to have consistent interfaces is that we don't want to underestimate the proficiency or efficiency of our users. Because the people who use our products, uh, unless you're Cameron, spend most of their time in other people's apps. Uh, or unless you owned Pokemon at the time of the Pokemon Go craze. So at the moment Pokemon Go launched, um, people kept using Facebook, YouTube, and Snapchat, but you can see this massive uptick where people who used Pokemon Go um, were using it at a much higher rate than they were any of those other applications, which would have been a prime time for any of those applications to steal uh, UI elements or interactions from Pokemon Go. And I'm a big fan of using the same interactions across different interfaces, in part because I rely on my procedural memory a lot as a designer. Uh, in some ways, it's important to be able to mindlessly um, build, a new, build a new grid or design a new interface. Um, does anyone here use Photoshop? This is like the lowest raised hands I've ever seen in my life. It's okay. What about Sketch? Right, um, Framer, people, all right. So uh, I switched uh, about um, five or six years ago from Photoshop to Sketch, and it was really difficult, in part because the letter R, for example, has vastly different meanings between Photoshop and Sketch. Uh, and so then when I started trying new design software, like Principle, there's, there's always this moment where you First of all, never read the instructions for anything. And second, you open up a new piece of software and you try using all the keyboard shortcuts you already know and you have this uh, feeling where you're holding your breath like, please let it work, please let it work, please let it work. And R makes a rectangle in principle. And my reaction was like this. I was like, it's a rectangle. Uh, which shows you how exciting my life is. But things like that are really important when you make, you know, you can make 100 rectangles in a day and you think about, if you don't have to think about how to make a rectangle every time, that's really nice. So, if you're thinking about making some design software, you're making improvements to design software, make sure you already understand what your users are doing and what they're using, and then try to take the shortcuts and the mental model they already have and use it in your own software. So if you want to attract existing users of someone else's products to your product, it, you just should try to interpret users' commands in the same way. Uh, I feel good about putting Bruce Tognazzini up there rather than saying this myself because it sounds like I'm advocating just straight up stealing people's UI ideas, um, but it wasn't, it's not me, it's Bruce. So these conceptually consistent interfaces are faster, they're more dependable, and they're friendlier to people. If you have a good feeling, of, if you're a Sketch user and you start using Principle, you're gonna have a relatively good feeling about it because it uses the same um, metaphors and the same shortcuts that you're already used to. And so you can see across interfaces like Photoshop, Sketch, and Principle that the metaphors translate from one to the next. Lastly, I want to go into real-world consistency before I tell you all the reasons to not be consistent. Uh, one of my favorite uh, VR applications is just a test app, and it's where you are at an office and you get to try out new VR interactions um, by doing the things people do in offices, <laughs> like drinking coffee. And the, the first time I used virtual reality, uh, I, I have to say, I've never used virtual reality at home for fun. I have just done it at work, which probably makes my use of it really weird. But the first time I used it, I 
played this test game, which teaches you a lot of VR skills. Also, oh, sorry. I don't want you listening to this. Okay. Turn off the sound from my computer. Thanks. So I uh, went to the, I'm you know, wearing this crazy headset and it's attached mm -hmm. via cord from the back of my head also, to this mega computer at Google. And I'm in a virtual reality room with 10 of my peers, which is the least comfortable way to ever do something in virtual reality where everyone else is not wearing a headset and you are. It's a very vulnerable feeling. And I played this and I put, you know, had my headset on. I was like, okay, I have my two joystick controllers. And I poured myself a cup of coffee. And then I was paying attention to something else and I bobbled my cup of coffee and the coffee, you know, in virtual reality, uh, I jostled it in the cup and I realized, oh no, I need to hold this cup straight so I don't spill this coffee, which is ridiculous because it's in virtual reality. It doesn't matter if I spill the coffee, I could throw the coffee across the room. But because the physics of the coffee were consistent with real world physics, my reaction to it was as though it was in the real world. So consistency, it builds on prior knowledge, it maps to people's concept model of the world, and it can close the knowledge gap. And it's important to think about consistency and how to apply it because uh, software is kind of magical. It's not mechanical. Software does not have to reveal the inner workings of a system to be able to provide an interface to people. So there are some good reasons out there to be inconsistent in the interfaces that we create. This, ah, uh, okay. Kerning, man. So the first reason to be inconsistent is that technology should make things easier than they are in the real world. So if your interface makes something it's consistent, but makes something harder to do, then you have not done a very good job. So you should be inconsistent when you have a better metaphor. Uh, when I talk about metaphors, I mean things like um, you know, page swipe versus tap um, on a UI, or thinking about a desktop itself. Um, every day, you choose to save or not save things to a folder called desktop, and yet it is in no way a desktop. Uh, so you can think about different metaphors like Tinder, for example, um, is that it's a different metaphor for thinking about judging somebody's looks. The, you wouldn't want to apply this metaphor to adopting a baby um, or a foster kid, uh, but for trying to figure out if you want to have sex with somebody, it can be helpful. So you should also be inconsistent when you want to stand out. Um, so if you think about something like coffee, uh, you can have small, medium, large cups of coffee. Uh, but if you want people to think about your coffee in a really different way, you can call your cup size by different names. Uh, this only really works if you're planning on opening 10,000 stores around the world uh, and dominating an industry, uh, but it works. You should also be inconsistent when you want to have fun. And uh, not just when you want people to play games, but when you want to add a feeling of delight to an interface. Uh, I think this is especially important and difficult for crowded marketplaces like to-do apps, uh, where you need to have a bit of inconsistency because otherwise, why build your app at all? Um, but a balance of consistency to make it possible to use it. And you should be inconsistent to use the advantages of technology. Uh, my favorite example of this uh, is teleportation. So think about uh, the pipes in, in Mario Brothers and how you can use a pipe to get from one place to the other. Uh, it's really important to think about what makes the technology you're using so special and what it does that's different than the real world and then start using that. So with virtual reality, the most boring virtual reality in the world is any virtual reality that is consistent with real life. If virtual reality is completely consistent with real life, what is the point of putting on goggles? 
Like the beauty of virtual reality is that you can fly through the air, uh, you can be teleported, uh, you can instantly zoom around, you can blow things up that are usually small to enormous sizes, or maybe you can take things that are usually large and make them tiny. Uh, so if you are designing for virtual reality, I would say that consistency is more your enemy than your friend. So types of consistency, internal, external, real world consistency. Within interface consistency, we have you know, six general areas that are important to us. And you should be inconsistent when you have a better metaphor, when you want to stand out, when you want to have fun, or when you're creating magic. And the way you can do that is by knowing your users and their tasks, and if you're not making the next version of Excel, then knowing their needs a little better than everyone else. So thank you.